Day four at Birmingham 2022 is done and dusted, and the show that recaps and analyzes the happenings, the Commonwealth Tonight Studio Show, starts now. And what a day it was, again for Trinidad and Tobago and their outstanding sprint star, Nicholas Paul, in cycling. A third medal inside three days for the 23-year-old Trini, and he has completed the full gamut of medals. Now gold, silver, and bronze, and it's the Australians, though, that are top of the table in the medals, standing 71 medals already for the Aussies. 31 gold, 20 silver, and 20 silver. And we have 20 bronze. England, 21 gold, 22 silver, and 11 bronze. 54 their total. And uh, the top 10 completed by New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, India, Scotland, Malaysia, Nigeria, and Wales. Page two now will tell you where a couple of the top performing Caribbean teams are TNT 13th at the moment with their three medals one gold one silver and one bronze all to the cyclist Nicholas Paul and the Bermudians with their one gold through Dame Flora Duffy the triathlon two-time Commonwealth gold medalist and also the reigning Olympic champion since the 1990 Commonwealth Games that's well, such a long time ago 32 years ago we have not had Another team outside of England topping the medal table outside of the Australians. 2014 in Glasgow, the English team had topped the medal table, but every other Commonwealth game since the 1990 games that were staged in Auckland would have been won by the Australians. As we said, cycling tops the show today, and Nicholas Paul, the man of the moment, he competed in the Kieran with a gold on Saturday, silver in the men's sprint on Sunday, and today he was in the 1K time trial and he was third best. That's such a hallmark of Nicholas Paul's sprinting that he can sprint and hold the sprint for a long time. This, though, is a completely different kettle of fish. This is a thousand meters. As the man from Trinidad and Tobago gets into the position, it was a relatively modest start from him. But can he hold it now? It's a second down already on the best With time of top. Sprint medal. Five hundredths of a second. That was the difference. Cornish, the crowd can see it. They can sense it. And it's just outside. Silver medal position from Nicholas Paul, who came... Well, Nicholas Paul has now picked up one of each type of metal, hasn't he? Gold, silver, and now bronze for Nicholas Paul. And that is the final result of the men's kilo time trial. Gletzer wins the only man over 60 kilometers an hour. Tom Cornish in the silver medal position. And yes, Nicholas so we've Paul. seen so many times where the Aussies have been 1-2 on the medal table in individual events in the swimming pool and so many other events so far at the Commonwealth Games 2022, the 22nd staging of the Commonwealth Games, and Nicholas Paul doing well for himself. Anil Roberts and Leighton Levy, our special guests tonight, analyzing what has happened at the Commonwealth Games for day four. And uh, another Trini medal, Anil Roberts and uh, Leighton. Um, we spoke last night, Anil, about the possibility of fatigue hitting Nicholas Paul, and you can't help but feel that that was a factor today as well. Well, definitely. It not only can you not help but feel but it's clearly so first and foremost nicholas paul getting on the plane landing with his bike the fastest man in the games today with tiredness his legs showing up he started off a second down now what does that mean that means not only is he exhausted is he tired he knows it he feels it and therefore he had to adjust his natural riding style had this race been done on the first day, he would have been clear by the first 250, 500. He would have been a second and a half clear of the field. And they would have come on because he, is, he has the ability to move that big gear, to churn it, the foot speed, the cycling speed, generate speed, get up quickly, move around, maintain speed. But at the end with those huge, powerful legs, he would decelerate and slow down more than the Australians who would not have that initial blast, but would have the ability to not decelerate as much. This is like if there was a race in track and field at 600 meters. I know they run it once in a blue moon, but a 600 meter, think about it, a pure sprint, but yet you have to maintain and take pain for the last 200 meters 
pain that will send you into dizzy spells, make you want to pass out. When you finish, you don't want anybody coming to take pictures or put a teddy bear in your hand. You just want to be by yourself to gasp some oxygen. That's how you feel in a kilo time trial. So he got bronze. I'm very happy. Gold, silver, bronze. But what it shows is when you go to a competition like this, Lance, you have to know what you came for. You have to know who you are. You have to know that when you win your first gold medal, that's one. I came for three. Therefore, you must focus. Forget the pictures. Forget the celebration. Forget the, uh, all the excitement. Get your recovery done. Get your icing done. Get your massage. Make sure and do your, your cool down of about 40 minutes of riding. Make sure you get the lactic acid out. Drink your fluids and prepare mentally for your next one. The party and the celebration will come when you get three. So for the next competition, I want his coaches, his management, and everyone to understand. Now that you believe we come for three, we come for three. When Usain Bolt goes to the Olympics, you don't celebrate after the first one. He celebrates after the four by one, his third gold medal. That's what you have to do. Yeah, and uh, Leighton, you know what? You know, so far, the games we have seen a lot of swimming, we've seen boxing and uh, the cycling as well. Great that Trinidad and Tobago's Paul has made such an important mark, certainly on the medal table. Three of the four medals won for the Caribbean so far. But your thoughts on Anil's comments here about the fatigue issue and the fact that on his best day, he could have probably had three gold medals instead of gold, silver, bronze. Absolutely. You saw, you, you, you saw the decline over the, over the past three days. And of course, it's tough in three, being in three finals on consecutive days. You don't have much time to recover. You don't have much time to get your wits about. You don't, get, you don't have time to get rid of lactic in those legs because one of the things, the bigger the muscles, the faster the lactic build up. And he, as most cyclists like Paul, you will see he has very massive legs. The lactic buildup in those legs comes very, very quickly, and it's very hard to get, those, that, get that lactic out. So on day three, like today, you clearly saw the lack of, the lack of power, the lack of explosiveness. And as, as Anil suggested, he was a second down after you know, the, the first lap. So you're know, looking at a situation where he was struggling to get up to pace and eventually cost him the gold. Yes, we know that track and field starts on, on Tuesday, which is where most of the Caribbean medals will come. TNT's most successful Commonwealth Games outing, Annie, would have been 1966 66. when the Games were staged in Kingston, Jamaica. I don't know if we'll ever see a Commonwealth Games being staged in the Caribbean again. Of course, the Commonwealth Youth Games will be staged mm -hmm. in TNT next year. But talk to us about the prospects of a TNT matching their nine medal haul back in 1966 in Kingston, given the fact that after only four days, you've already had three medals and there's still a lot more to come. Well, a lot more competition to come. A lot more competition. We won't match that. But we won't, uh, we won't match it. But we hope to get more medals. It's a great start. Nicholas Paul has carried the load. Uh, track and field is coming. We have some young up-and-coming athletes. But again, the depth that we require in order to say that we could overcome the greats of the Wendell Motley and David and, and Roberts and so on, that would be a bit asking too much. If we can pick up three or four more medals, in the, uh, in the track and field, I will be happy, so that might be seven. But I don't think we can surpass 1966 just yet. Uh, even with, when we're talking about Nicholas Paul, and when, when Leighton is talking about those muscles, in 1996, I was coaching Leah Martindale and Chauvin Cropper in the Olympics. But as you know, I was chief cook and bottle water, washer, so I was coach, manager, massage therapist, psychologist, all in one. And Gene Samuel was there with his manager, Castani. And Trinidad and Tobago did not send a massage therapist. And he saw me massaging, uh, getting the lactic acid out of Liam uh, muscles and so on. And, and the manager said, Gene needs a massage. And, and man, when I went down into the Trinidad and Tobago Games Village and massaged Gene Samuel legs, Lance, it's like massaging concrete. <laughs> when I finished that, after 40 minutes, I came out fall and I was fitter then, sweating, dripping. So you have to understand these cyclists, they are so fine-tuned that if you don't recover and take care of them, you see them slow down and like we saw Nicholas Paul. Yes. I would have taken a record of yes. his starts from the beginning yes. to now. Yeah. Okay, well, the Lee Valley Velo Park is in London, 
and uh, that's a good way from Birmingham City where our team has been, which is why we haven't uh, seen Nicholas Paul face-to-face -face with the Sportsmax team since the start of competition on Saturday. But our team, brilliant as they are, finally caught up with him today. And here's Nicholas Paul, the hero for the Caribbean so far at the Commonwealth Games. Yeah, it's, 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 it's coming up. Mm -hmm. we, we, we have him there. We, we just have him on pause. <laughs> Very as he, interested. As, to as, he, as he gets ready to talk. Yeah. But um, I just want to highlight the fact that cycling is an event that has given the Caribbean a few medals in global competition. Mm. Um, outside of track and field, Jamaica's, David Weller's only medal. bronze medal with David Weller back in 1980s. There are only other Olympic mm -hmm. medal outside of, of track and field. So we have seen Gene Samuel, the outstanding um, TNT rider uh, a few decades ago. Roger Gibbon, who won a, a, a cluster of Commonwealth Games medals back in 1966 in Kingston as well. Among the big cycling names that have um, done well at this level. But I think we finally got Nicholas Paul now, and here he is. Nicholas Paul, a full set of medals for you at the Commonwealth Games. Put into perspective what you have achieved over the last three days. Um, firstly, I must say big thanks to the Almighty because without him it wouldn't be possible. Um, the Commonwealth Games is one of my big uh, goals set for this year. So for me to come out of the Commonwealth Games with three medals, it's very spectacular and an honor for me. Talk to me about your gold medal performance in the Kieran, first of all. That would, of course, be the big one. 56 years, Trinidad and Tobago waited for a Commonwealth gold in cycling, and you delivered that. Yeah, I would say that one, that was my biggest win with this Commonwealth Games, and I was really proud of it. Um, it was unbelievable for me to come out here in my first race and get a gold medal. Um, it was just mind-blowing for me. And then you followed that up with a silver medal in the match sprint and a bronze medal today. Um, talk to me about those two performances as well. Um, after a long day in the Karen, to come out and back it up with a silver medal in the sprint was a great achievement for me. And then to come back out and repeat again and get a uh, bronze medal in the kilometer time trial was just amazing. You know, at the Olympic Games last year, you had that controversial disqualification, and I know that would have hurt you. How much did that disappointment fuel your preparation coming into 2022? I think you said it all. Um, after my little controversy in the Olympics, um, I just set my mind and said that I'm going to work really hard to get much faster, much more tactical and be able to produce good racing. So I think it all worked and I come to the Commonwealth Games and I executed well. You had the collarbone fracture earlier this year as well. How much did that affect you, if any at all? Um, it's setting me back a little bit, but I would say I got a major comeback to go and get two gold medals at the Cali Nations Cup and then to come out here and get three medals again, I think it's just amazing. You know, we watched that match sprint and there was a lot of discussion about it on Sports Max going right across the Caribbean, yeah, yeah. especially in the final where it was felt that you probably made a couple of mistakes, especially in the in the first sprint in the final. Yeah. How do you feel you executed that one tactically? Because there's a feeling that, you know, you were clearly the faster rider, but maybe tactically you were outwitted a little bit. Yeah, I would say sprinting is basically a thinking game. I would say you can be really fast, but one mistake and you can lose the race. So I think that happened, and I think it's something to go back to the drawing board and come again. So it's just something to work on and see how it goes from there. How do you get better in that department? Is it a case of just more racing? Is it something that you have to do in training? How, how do you improve in that department? Um, in that department, I think it's an all around. I think more racing, more watching of videos, and more... Um, reading your opponent. So I think it's just an all around learning curve. You're only 23 years old. It's amazing that you've achieved so much already at such a young age. What does the future hold for Nicholas Paul? Um, I always say to myself, the sky is the limit. I never let anything or anyone block you. So I always look for the best and try to work as hard as I can to get it. So that's me. And I know there is an ultimate goal, especially over the next two years. Talk to us about what that ultimate goal is. I live, sleep and dream for that. I want to win a medal at the Olympic Games. So leading up to Paris, I'm going to work very hard to try to achieve that. And hopefully it comes true. Yeah, and we had a chat with Delia Palmer earlier on. And she said, you know what, you're the perfect person 
to sell the sport of cycling across the Caribbean. Are you ready to take on that mantle and run with it? Yeah, I wouldn't say take on the mantle, but it's something that I love to do. So I want to show the younger generation after me and the ones who are still older than me that the sky is the limit. I want to work hard, anything is possible. So he's out yeah. a minute. But yeah, man of the moment at the Commonwealth Games for the Caribbean, Nicholas Paul, triple medalist at the Games so far. He's also, at the moment, the world record holder for the 200-meter flying. And this guy's really, really fast. We're looking for more big things from him in the near future. We go to break. When we come back, there's a lot that happened at the NEC Hall today with netball. And we'll talk about that. So two of the gold medal favorites in netball were in action today at the NEC Hall. Jamaica's Sunshine Girls and the Diamonds, that's what they call the Aussies. Uh, the Aussies defeating South Africa comfortably and a massive win for the Jamaicans over Barbados, 103-24. Uh, to 24. The first time in the Commonwealth Games this year that a team has scored over 100 points. Now we knew that the Jamaicans would dominate Barbados, but the margin of victory was, was awesome. And the Jamaicans look really, really sharp. And it'll, and it'll because um, we know that the Sunshine Girls are harboring gold medal thoughts here. There's no question about it. Although New Zealand and Australia are the top two teams in the world, England and Jamaica have gained on them over time. And uh, a, a lot to be happy about in the Jamaican camp today. Absolutely. I was very impressed with the performance today. Um, a couple of nights ago, George and Anil and I were having a discussion where Anil dis disagreed with the idea of putting your foot on the neck of your opponent and crushing them. That's exactly what Jamaica did to Barbados today. In the fourth quarter, le already leading 73 to 17, Jamaica scored the first 12 points of the fourth quarter yes. and put their foot down the way they should have. In fact, the, the quarter ended, it was the highest scoring quarter, 30 to Barbados is seven. This is a performance that tells the rest of the teams they are contending for medals that Jamaica is ready to take on the best of them this year. Yes. And th look, to, to go back to the point you made earlier, the reason why I think the belief is in the Jamaican team this year, like number before, is that virtually every member of that starting squad plays internationally in the Suncorp Super League or in the, in U in the UK. Yes. So they have that inter international experience. And that, I think, has boosted this team's confidence that they'll be able to take on the best in the world. Yeah, they are the quarterly scores. 23-5 in the first quarter, 28-4 in the second quarter, 22-8 in the third quarter, and 30-7 in the fourth and final quarter. So Barbados kept the single digits in every single quarter. Um, Shimona Nelson, who plays for the Collingwood Magpies in the Suncorp Super Netball League, down under 58 goals from 60 attempts, 97% shooting. Janiel Fowler came on to play just 15 minutes, 24 goals, 89% accuracy, and the Jamaicans really, really dominant here. Anil had suggested last night when we were previewing this match that Jamaica should go in with a second string team and rest their big guns for the knockout matches, which is where the medals will be. There was some hint of that today because there are a couple of starters that, Shimona started, yeah. that, that, didn't, that weren't starters in the earlier games. Um, but not completely so, because the big guns came in at some point. How satisfied are you, Anil, with Coach Connie Francis and how she deployed her unit today? Very impressed. And uh, that's what it's about. She did exactly what she needed to do. She would have said, okay, I want to rest my big guns. I want to be ready for New Zealand and Australia. But I maybe don't want them to get a full rest. I want to keep them sharp to give them some managed minutes. That is brilliance. That is intelligent. L listen to me very carefully. Netball is the Commonwealth Games. If you have to choose from the Olympics, what's the Blue Ribbon event? It's the 100 meters track and field. Okay? Men and women. Commonwealth Games, it's netball. Netball is a Commonwealth sport. If you have to choose the Blue Ribbon medal of the Commonwealth Games, yeah, yeah. it is netball, I proffer to you today. Yeah. And I am saying that Jamaica, for the Caribbean, and for all of us, must get that gold medal. 
how will they get it? They're starting to believe, but the fans, the support, the people, the messages, the social media must focus on building and uplifting this Jamaica women's team. Now, you don't have to be Jamaican. From Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, Grenada, come around, Cayman Islands. Send messages and let them believe that they can beat Australia, that they will be, beat Australia. Because what I am seeing in this Jamaica team is pure brilliance, creativity, taking the game to a different level. You can see the Australians play sort of like the Germans in football, very systematic, very technical. Jamaica has that plus some flair, plus some intuition plus the Maradona effect, which is something that cannot be taught. The only weakness that I see in Jamaica relative to New Zealand and Australia is the actual belief that the gold medal will go around their necks. Yeah, all right, because New Zealand have been world champions before. Australia have been many times world champions, more Commonwealth gold medals than any other team. So they have reason to believe the Jamaicans tend to fall short, finishing third on most of the major major events or fourth mm -hmm. i want to ask you this though because you spoke about the use of players like janelle fowler who is regarded as the world's best shooter she hasn't played a lot of minutes so far but you made a point anil about keeping her sharp it's one thing to rest her but there is the need for her to come into the games keep the feel and the momentum and keep the sharpness because you don't want to, to go into the big games cold. Yeah, no, definitely not. I mean, you look at what happened today when Shimona Nelson was outstanding for the first three quarters. 58 out of 60, you said, Chami, um, she got support from Rebecca Robinson and, of course, Chinese Beckford. You know, so they really didn't need to have um, Janil play today. But she came in in the fourth quarter and she hit the ground running. She scored the first 12 points, I yes. think, very easily. In fact, yes. she scored five Five goals in the first minute. Yes. And of course, 24 to 27 yes. for the quarter tells you that she's right there ready. So when they need her for the next big game, yes. she's on point. Yeah. I want to talk a, a little bit about Barbados and their struggles in this tournament so far, which we spoke about last night as well. But the issue of uh, the choices that Connie Francis has because of the multiple tools she is working with the point has been made that although Janiel Fowler is regarded as the best shooter in the world at the moment, Shimona Nelson is a tremendous player with different skills from Janiel Fowler. May this be something that Coach Connie Francis could use to Jamaica's benefit because Shimona Nelson is more mobile than Janiel Fowler is, not as big as Janiel Fowler is, but more mobile and can provide a different kind of obstacle for the big teams to overcome yeah one of the things you need to keep your big players fresh huh? your your stars one of the things that shimona nelson can do in like in a big game where the pressure and intensity is high you, you can take um follow out of that game give her a few minutes to get her breath and have shimona take over without losing much in terms of your scoring ability because as we've seen and of course you've seen in the some yes. super league as well yes. she's a very efficient scorer yes. so that if, if, if you take out Jenny out of, out, of the, out of the setup, you don't lose much with introducing a, a Shimona Nelson who can keep that scoring going. She's tall, she's physically um, capable, she's uh, very agile and athletic. In, in fact, as you mentioned, more athletic than, than Jenny Fowler is. So you don't lose much in terms of that, but you also get an opportunity to rest Fowler for the critical moments of that game without the fatigue factor taking over. Yes. Lance, what you're talking about there is what it's going to come down to. Yes. Connie Francis has to be so tired mentally yes. after playing that game against New Zealand and Australia. Her brain cannot stop. She has to keep throwing different looks at those Australians to throw them off. Yes. She can't play one way for a sustained period. Oh, yeah. She has to come up just like Phil Jackson would do yes. or like the Celtics coach this year. Change it up and keep them confused. Yeah. Use everything you have yeah. to shatter them. Yeah, and in 15 seconds, because we have to go to the break now, uh, Barbados would be disappointed with their overall outing and today's hammering as well. Lack of fitness, lack of preparation, it's clear. This team, when you looked at how Jamaica swarmed them to like piranhas every time they had the ball, they just weren't ready for this competition and clearly not ready for Jamaica today. Yeah, we still have a lot more to come here on Commonwealth tonight. Recapping what happened at the Commonwealth Games on day four. Boxing and weightlifting were among the big events that happened today. And when we come back, we'll talk about them.
A pretty good day in the boxing ring for the Caribbean today with the Ghanese uh, Kevin Alicock among the winners, along with the St. Lucian Arthur Langelier. And uh, there was a win for the Jamaican Jerome Innes in the light heavyweight division abo above the Australian Billy McAllister, which was a, a gripping bout as well. He won that one narrowly. But we've all here on this show been excited by the prospects of Kevin Alicock, the Guyanese, who was an unfortunate first round loser at the Olympic Games in Tokyo last year to the Dominican Republic's uh, De La Cruz, uh, Miguel. And uh, he was disappointed. He thought he should have gotten the victory on the points, but he didn't. So he has come to the Commonwealth Games here looking for revenge. And he today, gentlemen, was above, uh, uh, against the Sri Lankan opponent, Jiwantha Nishanka, and he was flawless. He won by 5-0, which means that all five judges scored him a winner and all five judges scored him a convincing winner as well. He looked very, very sharp today. Anil, you talked about him last night and he's one of the best amateur boxers I've seen in the Caribbean for some time. And he showed it today. Definitely. And I, I wonder if we have the package because I wonder people to see him because he has not only skill, but he has the flair to make you want to watch boxing. Yeah. So I don't know if they're going to show it. If they are, we'll run it and then we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, it's got to be shown where yeah. we're, we're, we, we have, you know, some, some footage of, of the fight itself. But this is a boxer that has done a lot of work. He has this coach, Siebert Blake, who was himself a former national champion and a former multiple Caribbean mm -hmm. champion as well. And he has also qualified himself as a, 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 a boxing coach of repute. And the work he has done with there Kevin is. Alicock here I want you to watch tremendous. it. Yeah. Well, his, the coach, I'm glad you spoke about it. Yeah. If you see, if we had footage from last year Tokyo Games, yes. you can see that Ali Cock has put on about seven pounds, six, seven pounds of muscle. And what that has done is created, when you go and you, you're in a sport, you can't just go in the gym and go wild because you've got to be specific in your exercises. Yes. Put muscle on where you need it yes. and don't put on useless muscle because then you'll get fatigued. You slow down and so on. He put the muscle on in the correct places. It has not slowed him down. He's gotten more confident. His hands and his style, his pugilistic skill is incredible. He's boxing the sweet science like we love to see it. He destroyed the Sri Lankan. And he has a sort of confidence and a flair that I would like to see him after this step out to be professional. It yeah. would be nice. Yeah. Well, on Saturday, it was very impressive of, uh, defeating the Kenyan Nick Okoth. We saw that, that bout. And uh, I, I think that's where it sort of re-energized uh, Anil's interest in this boxer because he has so much quality. He looked just as flawless today. I will say that all five judges scored him a clear winner. In fact, four of the five judges had him winning every single round. Mm -hmm. There was one judge who had him losing one of the three rounds, but comfortably winning the others. So this, unlike some of the other boxing that we had, we had seen so <laughs> far, had no space for a judge misinterpreting what he has seen. He yeah, she, and that's yeah. what you want to be. I mean, you know, he, and you said it best, his ring craft obviously has improved a lot. And, I mean, when you look at it defensively, in attack, you know, he's, he's always in position to strike. And that's what you want about, you know, for a boxer to, to be able to maximize, especially in these, comp these amateur competitions where the judging is, you know, largely dependent on... on the number of contacts that you're able to make and how you manage the fight. And I think Alcock demonstrated all of those things today. Yeah, really, really impressive. As you said, he won 5-0 on the point score. And, and his ability, up. Lance, is brilliant. When he goes in, he fights in combination punches. Mm -hmm. You know, some of our Caribbean boxers like to wait for that one big punch. Yeah. He's going in, hitting you a three-punch combination and coming back out defensively and tiring the Sri Lankan because anyone who does, does boxing knows when you swing and miss, it takes more energy than when you swing and hit. Mm -hmm. And when he comes in, hits you three punches. And coming back out, the Sri Lankan is trying to tag him, but his defensive maneuvering is so skillful. It was frustrating for the Sri Lankan, but a brilliant bout, brilliant fighting by the Guyanese. Yeah, there were some losses for the Caribbean men today. Uh, but Charles Cox of Barbados lost his bout against uh, Kevin Bouchajo of Canada. There was defeat as well for Curlin Richardson of Anguilla. He was up against Yusuf Changawali of Tanzania. And uh, there was also defeat for 
uh, let's see... Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago. But it wasn't Anthony, a defeat. Anthony Joseph, yeah. Yeah, that close side. It wasn't a defeat, Lance. Yes. I'm going to say it. Yes. <laughs> it may not be as bad as 1988, Roy Jones Jr. against the Korean in the Korean Seoul Olympics. But Joseph won the fight. He was brilliant. Look at him there. He came out. I just watched it. I scored it myself. He won the first round. He lost the second round, and he won the third round. It was yeah. close, but I think the judges got it absolutely wrong. This was one of the most exciting bouts of the day, fighting against the Pakistani boxer Hussein. Yeah. But uh, Joseph could feel well aggrieved, but I must say I'm proud of him because even though he knew, and you can see it in his face, yeah. that he knew he won, and the judges took it away from him, he acted with pure class. Yeah. professionalism and represented the red white and black brilliantly he didn't show any pain or frustration when he should have because Lance he won that fight but if you look at the Pakistani's body language he yeah. felt he I'm sure he felt he lost yes because his body language suggested okay I lost this one yeah and I think you know it was a close fight and you know sometimes that's the way it breaks I guess but you know Joseph fought really well today yeah he lost the he lost about three two uh, so three judges scored the fight 29-28, and the other two judges scored it 29-28. The two 29-28 in favor in of favor. Anthony Joseph, yes. and the other two 29-28 scoring it in favor of uh, Yusuf uh, Ilyas Hussein from Pakistan. So a very, very close fight, just one point for each round in it. So a huge performance from Anthony Joseph. He did really well, but he fell short of the mark. There was also some weight lifting today, gentlemen, and the Jamaican Omari Mears, he finished 11th in the 81 kilogram division, and uh, he um, tried to make a mark for weight lifting. We have to remember that originally on the global platform, weight lifting was pretty big for the Caribbean. The second Olympic gold medal won by the Caribbean was won by Rodney Wilkes. Silver. First medal Silver. ever for Trinidad and Tobago, 1948, uh, 1948 London Olympics. Olympics. And this happened just a few days after Arthur Wint had won the 400. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, and he came back in Helsinki and then to win a, 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 win a bronze medal. Lennox Kilgore yes, also So, so there is yeah. history for the Caribbean in weightlifting. But here is Mears trying to resuscitate uh, <laughs> on the international stage. Uh, but he only managed 11th Now, Lance, year. as you talk about Rodney Wilkes, let me tell you why coaching and brilliance and intuition comes in. I got the opportunity to interview him ba yes. back in 2007 at his home. Yes. When he was on the ship going to the 1948 Olympics, yes. his coach at the time was Alex Chapman, who then became the perennial president of the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee. Yes. And Alex Chapman saw him weightlifting. He was just going through his motions, lightweights yeah. and so on, yes. while the other Americans and were lifting heavy. And he told him, well, get heavier. And Rodney Wilk, in 1948, told his coach, yes. no, yes. I will keep that for the competition. Yes. That is where tapering has come. He knew that 40 years before the science said, yes. you must rest in order to do your best. Yes. This is where the brilliance and the genius come from. You yes. know, you did... They couldn't explain it scientifically, but yes. he knew it. Yeah. And the big thing about it today is that this, this performance, even though he finished 11th, yes. is a big step forward for the Jamaica but, um, Weightlifting Federation. Because you remember, I think Jamaica last competed at internationally at, uh, in 1988 at the, the Seoul Olympics. But it's been, so it's been 20 odd years. Last year, in uh, the, pa the Panam Games, his combined weight was 240 kilograms. Mm. Today, 273. It's, it's a step, it's, yes. it's building the, the foundation of, of, the, of the federation of the, as they try to make a return after a very long break. So I think this is a very commendable performance from him. Yeah. I mean, you look at the fact that they're, they're bringing in a, a whole bunch of new kids to the sport, you know, including Rex Nicholas's grandniece. You know, <laughs> they're making some steady steps forward. And of course, it's not going to happen overnight. Weightlifting, heavy, weightlifting is not something that you, you snap your finger and you suddenly but Lance, good at. And later, I don't know about you all. But watching that, having had two surgeries on my knees from football, yeah. anterior cruciate ligament replacement, yeah. that is painful to watch. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's yeah. amazing, the flexibility, the power, and the skill 
Mm -hmm. I don't know. You yeah. could look well, at he, it. He, if had it hurts a, he, me had, he had a snatch total of 126 kilograms, mm -hmm. and then he had the clean and jerk at 147, which, is which totaled the 273 that Leighton just mentioned, which is a significant improvement on what he did at the at the Panam game. He's 240. So, yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm I'm suggesting that he is likely to be reasonably satisfied with his outing at the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham City today, and uh, looking forward to lift his standards even higher. No pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, about, he's about 35, almost 40 Ks off where the, the medals are. Yes. And given where he's coming from, from last year, yes. you can see where maybe in another year or two, he's right there with them in terms of the, 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 the combined weight. Yeah. You know, so, you know, it's progress, I think. Yeah. We have swimming to come after the break. Join us then. Commonwealth tonight or day four of Birmingham 2022 today. The swimming pool had some interesting action for the Caribbean swimmers today. Uh, Jaden Vulies from Antigua and Barbuda had a fairly good morning session. So did Lillian Higgs from the Bahamian team. And uh, there was also Cayman's Harper Barrowman, who has in fact qualified for the 800 free final. But let's start with uh, Jaden, the Antiguan, who is based in the USA, well, US born, actually at Texas Christian University at the moment, uh, got through his men's uh, 50 meter breaststroke heats this morning uh, well enough to make the semis. Yes, and we, we expected that from his swim in the 100. He, he came down, uh, he swam his best time, and he got into the semifinals of the 100. So when in breaststroke, once you've got that speed and you can sustain it for the 100 to go a 102, you should be able to get down under 28 seconds for the 50 and get into the semifinal. So he looked very good. He's a very powerful lad. When you're doing breaststroke, because of the energy component that is necessary, you would see that breaststrokers tend to be more muscular than any other swimmer. They have barrel chest and the big shoulders, biceps, because they real, but it's also, it gives you a mirage effect. Because the real speed and power comes from the legs. You may look at the barrel chest and the arms and think, well, they're going to pull themselves through the water. That's not necessarily true. The sweep in the front is just to keep the body high up in the water like a speedboat. But the real power, the real drive come from the legs, as you can see. And now long ago, we couldn't do that butterfly kick. But now with the change... Rule change, they can do it. You see how high up he's right here, closest to you on the screen. And his timing is miraculous and uh, unbelievable. You want that kick to be early. When you come up to your highest point, when your head is at the highest point, you want to begin to drive your legs and surge forward. As you can see, his timing is impeccable. And therefore, he got a great swim. He came seventh. But that heat was so fast that seven of those swimmers yes. went on into the top 16. Fastest time, 27.2. You could see that uh, the, the fastest in the world will get down to 26 flat, 25 high when PT is in form. Yes. Um, and the great South African. But this guy from Antigua has a future. If he continues to work, he's got to get down under a minute before the Olympics to get a chance to be in the semifinal and down to about a 26.3. Yeah. But he has the potential to do that. Yeah, I'm very happy. To his 100 breaststroke outing on Saturday, 102.38, yeah. a national record, Correct. breaking the 102.44 he had done at the Caribbean yeah. Games in Guadeloupe earlier on this summer. But you're suggesting that he needs to go below, below, a minute. below a minute. Okay, Olympics, he's got, okay, he has the technique, he has the timing, now he has the national records. But to talk about Olympics, he's got to set a 59-6. That will give him the opportunity to compete for a semifinal place. How is he going to do that? Yes. He's got to get in the weight room and increase 
his squats and his, his, his lunges. Whatever he's doing, he has to up that by probably 50, 60 pounds. Four to six more sets every four, four times for the week. He's got to do a lot more kicking on the board, without the board, on the back. Breaststroke kicking is where it's at. He's yeah. got to increase his flexibility and, of course, his endurance. Breaststroke is a, a, a taxing stroke. So he's got to do some anaerobic threshold sets, which is like 40, 100 with 30 seconds rest in between with his heart rate up at 165, which is torturous and painful. But he's got to get that average down. He may be doing it now at about 118. If yeah. he can do 40 of those at about 108, you yeah. can talk about 59. Yeah. But everything now, from now till 20, 24 yes. has to be 59, 59, yeah. sub, sub one minute. Okay, so 53, 50 breasts today. He went 28, 44 in the heats in the morning, went 28, 13 in the semis, but still that wasn't good enough and he was 13th, but he improved on his morning time, which is good on him. Lillian Higgs, the Bahamian, competed in the 100 breaststroke for women and uh, she did reasonably well. She qualified for the semis with her clocking of 112, 67, which was the 16th fastest, which means that she just made it in, uh, wasn't able to get to the final later on in the day. But how do you assess her effort? Well, 112 is too slow. Uh, back in 1995, I, have a two, I had a 12-year-old girl called Kerry Ann Gibbs who went a 111 and a 236. If you want to be in the reckoning yes. and girls breaststroke, you can be a great female breaststroker at the age of 15. You can win an Olympic gold because a, a woman matures much faster than a man. So the anaerobic capacity stops yes. developing. So you can compete at 15 years old with a woman who's 25 or 30. But 112 will not cut it. Yeah. You have to get down at 107 to even yeah. be considered in yeah. the top 30 yeah. in the world. She has the potential. The stroke is good. But there are certain deficits that you can see. Yeah. On the start, she comes up about a second and a half behind. She's got to improve her start, improve yeah. her streamlining, improve her timing. Just yeah. general. I, a lot I, of work I remember Kerry Ann Gibbs well. Didn't she win about 30-odd? Carifta medals overall in her junior career? Easily. If, yeah. And she won one at 10 years old in yes. the under 12. And then they banned 10 year olds from swimming yes, because I, it was embarrassing. I remember her <laughs> well. Yes. In the heats, then, Lillian Higgs uh, did 112.67. In the semis later in the day, 112.97. So she was slower. So Jaden Vulliers went faster in yes. the semi final. Higgs went slower in hers. Well, that's also concerning, even though at that pace we can't read as much into it. But yeah. you need obviously to understand that as the lights get brighter you must get faster so even though at this level we're going all out in the morning because you know when you are top like george bovell when you rank number top five in the world you could control yourself in the heats because you know your yes. ability and yes. so on but when you're on the outside looking in the heats could be your final. So you have to wake up early. You have to drink your coffee. You have to do your wake-up swim. You have to do your warm-up. You have to psych up. You have to get serious. Because even at your best time, you may not get back into the final. So uh, it's not good that you swim in the morning and then you get a second swim and go slower. Because you're always preparing for that final. And if you start to create a, a history or a legacy of going slower when it counts, that doesn't augur well. The big winners get faster when it, with the brighter the lights, the faster yeah. they go. Okay, in the 800 free then, Anil, we had um, the Cayman swimmer, Barrowman, Harper Barrowman. Yeah. She went 9.16.49 to qualify for the final because those seats qualified yeah. uh, other swimmers directly to the final. But the fastest, Lani Pallister, was 8.32.67, yeah. which is a, a long, long way faster than Barrowman went. Well, she got into the final because the event is weak, because 9.16 is, is not the sort of level that you would want to be at a Commonwealth Games. I mean, yes. you'd see Titmus and those girls went 8.30-something, but they were cruising. They could get down to 8.17 or 8.15. So a minute off is way off. But it's good to make a final, to be there. But I hope that she learns that if she wants to compete, there is a lot of work to be done. But the good thing to do is when you're, when you're that far off, there is a lot of things that can help you improve. So you can improve very quickly. It's hard to improve from 820 to 814. Um, I would love to see Titmus and Ledecky get it on. Um, that would be big money, big TV events. But yeah. So it's, it's congratulations for getting a final swim, yeah. but...
I want to I want to get your quick comment on the Canadian 15 year old phenom in the 400 IM Summer McIntosh who had a 212.12 clocking today. How how good is she at 15? Wow, that but that's what you're talking about. And when you see a Canadian swimmer at at 15 years old doing 212 with great coaching, great competition, great system in place, great technique, you can see that linear progression that Leighton was talking about. So in two years' time, three years' time, she could be down to the 207, 208 range and be in medal contention. The Canadians have come back finally. For years, they were spending an enormous amount of money and not getting any results. I would take two or three swimmers with no money, no nothing, and get into Olympic and World Championship finals, and the Canadians will have a whole team with special iPads and computers and all the best, and they wouldn't get one finalist. But for the last eight years, their high-performance program through good coaching has been churning out. This Liendo fella. Yes, I was Edward, about to ask about him. That's a Trini. Yes, his, his parents are Trini. Wow. And he actually lived in Trinidad and yes. Tobago between the ages of three and nine. I yes. I and he started swimming in TNT. Correct. So it's not one of those Canadians who started swimming in Canada. He yeah. started swimming in Trinidad because his parents had relocated because he he has Trin did, did you ever meet him no never but I'm happy to say he's a Trini but he's a little <laughs> off now he's at the long end of the taper so he's not at his best right now yes but let me tell you when I see a black man swimming and beating people it gives me an extra sense of pride the sport was never open to us back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and so on, because the pools were only in the elite areas across the globe and even in the Caribbean. So they used to say, scientists used to say that we could not swim and we shouldn't be in that sport, but it's showing it. Anthony Nesty showed it in 1988, Leah Martindale, Alia Atkinson, and this Liendo Trini Canadian, when he gets hurt, I'm telling you right now, for yes. the Olympics, yeah. He is going to be the man to challenge Caleb Dressel for that gold medal yeah. in the 100 free. Yeah. Well, he's still, he's, just, he's still just 19 years old. Yeah. And I want to take you up on the point about a, a black swimmer representing Canada and so on, because he is actually the first Canadian black swimmer to medal at a global event. Correct. And, and I must say, I take a bit of pride in this development and seeing it. The, the USA gold medalist in the 100 freestyle 2016 Olympics. When she was five years old, her parents were watching the Atlanta Olympics and saw Leah Martindale of Barbados walk up and wave and swim in the 50-meter freestyle final of the Olympics. That encouraged them to get their child into the pool. And in 2016, she became the first black gold medalist at the Olympics. Leendo is a man that I think between him and there's a young guy coming out of Hungary and Caleb Dressel, those are going to be the three to dance. And I'm, I must back my Trini Canadian yeah, so, so, boys. So, so Leah Martindale inspired U.S. black swimmers. Correct. Okay. And, and, and just like Nesty yeah. in, inspired a whole wave yeah. of, of swimmers. And, 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 and who coached Leah Martindale again? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can't on, remember. I can't it remember. It was one of my greatest pleasures, you know, to, <laughs> to do that. It was a lot of work, but she was, no, it was really tremendous. And then... Yes. To go into Gothenburg, Sweden in 1997 World yes. Championships, yes. a black Caribbean coach with yeah. Siobhan Cropper and uh, Leah Martindale, two yes. black girls getting into the final yes. in the World yes. Championship. And we should say Leah Martindale is now a coach. She's coaching Daniel Titus, the Correct. young Barbadian who just missed out on qualifying yes. for a final today. Daniel Titus from on Commonwealth tonight. Start. Yes, so we are back on Commonwealth tonight, the studio show, and uh, we are going to talk some track and field now because track and field starts on Tuesday, and uh, the St. Vincent and the Grenadines athlete Handel Roban uh, spoke to us in Birmingham as he gets ready for competition, which he's so excited about. Yeah, um, we're, we're, we're coming to him pretty soon. 
but you know that track and field starts on uh, Tuesday and it will be live in the morning on the Sportsmax broadcast family co uh, covering the Commonwealth Games. And here is Handel Roban at 800 meter man getting ready for action for Sweet SVG. Handel Roban, 2022, how would you describe your year to this point? Well, to be honest, it has been a phenomenal year. Um, I thank my coaches and my support team, my parents, and my country for picking me to represent them in the past two games. The first Caribbean Games, which I got bronze medal, and my first Commonwealth Games, which I'm here now. So I think it's been a good season so far. You continue to get faster and lower that national record, 148.31. Coming into the Commonwealth Games, how are you feeling? To be honest, I'm feeling pretty confident, but you know, I'm not a talker. I show it more in the track, so we'll see when that day comes. You had that phenomenal experience at the World Under 20 Championships last year, getting to the semi-finals. How has that helped you coming into 2022? Um, it was a pretty good experience. Um, first time running against the Kenyans <laughs> was a very, I'll say, a hectic <laughs> feeling, but I'm pretty thankful for the experience. When you think about where you are now, have you surprised yourself in any way given what you have achieved over the last three or four years? Um, well, to be honest, it's all about being patient and being true to yourself. So if you believe anything and believe in your ability, I mean, the sky is the limit, they say, but I think the sky, there's, we can go beyond the sky, to be honest. Given all of that, what would you say are your goals for these Commonwealth Games? Well, to be honest, keep breaking my own national record. And how would you say the preparations have gone coming into this event? Well, it's been up and down, you know. Nothing is smooth really and truly, but I'm thankful so far. So I'm just ready to run and go out there, show my country. When the Commonwealth Games is over, what would you like to take away from it all? To be honest, the experience. So the next time I come back, I can know what I want. So at this point, it's all about the experience at the moment. And Roban getting ready to compete for St. Vincent and the Grenadines over 800 meters. The two-lap event at the Commonwealth Games track and field starts on Tuesday. And that's why we have replaced Anil Roberts with uh, Obadele Thompson, bronze medalist over 100 meters at the Sydney Olympics in 2000. And uh, he was a former standout runner for the University of Texas in El Paso, UTEP. Hall of Famer in two divisions for UTEP. Uh, uh, Oba with uh, the Sport Hall of Fame and also the overall School Hall of Fame. Great to have you. Great to be here and it's uh, good that we're finally getting on the way with some some track and field. <laughs> good okay. times ahead. Yeah, I, I, I know and I think I think, I think think Leva feels the same way. Let's start with the women's 100 meters though because uh, that starts off. The men will also start as well. But we've had, we have had a lot of uncertainty from the Jamaican perspective about who are the athletes that would, uh, would actually be there because Sherika Jackson announced in Oregon immediately after her successes there that the Commonwealth Games would have been her next assignment, but she uh, subsequently decided to skip the Commonwealth Games. Leighton, you have your uh, pulse on these things. Um, what's the final story and how is the 100-meter field looking like? Well, there has been a further setback because um, Natasha Morrison was also, is also out as well. But they tried to get Brianna Williams in. But because the GCF, actually, the Commonwealth Games um, Federation, made the decision late. Yes. The earliest flight into the UK for Brianna Williams would have been tomorrow morning. That's just pretty much the same time on the 100. So she's out. Yes. So that leaves now pretty much Elaine Thompson here as the the likely contender for yes. Jamaica for the for the medals there in terms of the 100 meters, but a very very strong contender nonetheless. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, 1081, 1079 are season's best time mm -hmm. makes her, I think, a very strong favorite yeah, for um, the gold medal in yeah. Oba and the field also includes a couple of quality sprinters as well. Michelle Leah Yi from Trinidad, right. TNT, um, former champion, and um, Joella Lloyd from Antigua and Barbuda, are pretty solid runners themselves. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think Elaine, of course, the old double double Olympic champion, mm -hmm. is the class of the field. I think she should be able to win quite handily. Uh, as you mentioned, Julianne Alfred, 
from yes, St. Lucian. Lucian. Yes. She's the NCAA champion, and she has run 10.8 a few times this season. Uh, unfortunately, I think she, she false started at the World Championships, uh -huh. but she also won the inaugural, inaugural Caribbean Games. So she's there. Mich Michelle Liaie, who is the defending champion, is there. Yes. You also have Dal Nita from England. From England. Yes. Uh, exactly. And she was an Olympic finalist. So, so there are a couple of people. But to be very honest, um, I think Elaine should have this quite handily. Yeah, she was a little below par at the Eugene World Championship. Um, looks a little bit, you know, short on confidence as well. Um, mentally, how do you think she approaches Commonwealth, given her Eugene World Championship experience wasn't what she had hoped? Yeah, I'm actually surprised that she turned up for the World Championships. And perhaps there are many factors uh, going into that decision. She came fourth in 2018 in the 200 behind Shawnee Milowebo, Sharika, and Dina Asher Smith in the 200. Mm. Um, perhaps it's the fact that she is seeking a title that she's never had. Shelly Ann doesn't have this title. So this will be something perhaps to put in her cap, and especially with a new sponsor, Puma, to say, you know, I've won a championship. Mm. Um, but yeah, she's definitely going to need a booster. And yeah. I think this may be the opportunity for her yeah. to really get back on track and to establish herself once again mm. as being a prime contender for the fastest woman in the world. Yeah. Um, Elaine, Elaine is considered the favorite as far as uh, Oba is concerned, uh, Leighton. But Julian Alfred, huge disappointment in the semifinals at the Eugene World Championship when she falls started. How shattering would that have been for her? And how well do you think she will do in Birmingham? It's been pretty difficult. It will be pretty difficult for her because one, it's been a long season for her. Huh? Yes. She's had to peak like at least two times so far this year in CAAs and of course for the, the Caribbean Games mm -hmm. that she didn't, she won, but she didn't, wasn't particularly fast. But yeah, she 11 to 34, be. I yeah, think. She didn't yeah. need to be. Went to the World Championships. I don't know what her aspirations were, but certainly would have been involved getting into the final, which she didn't because of that false start. So this is an opportunity for her to, to find some kind of redemption at the Commonwealth Games. Whether or not she's physically capable at this, length, this time of the season, because it's almost August. But it is August, sorry. Um, she's been doing this since indoors. Yes. You know, so she might be a little tired. Yeah. The Bohemian Tinia Gaither also fall started. Both were really narrow and marginal fall starts over. You know about the pressure of coming out of the starting blocks for a 100 meter sprint, even more so than a 200. Um, uh, what were your thoughts on those fall starts? Yeah, it was extremely weird to have those fall starts being that close. I've never seen a fall start, even the. the 110-meter hurler from the United States, Devin Allen. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the threshold is 0.100, which is a tenth of a second. They had it at 0 0.099 and 0 0.0998. That's really close. That's imperceptibly close. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's part of the game. It's the rules of the game. And athletes must be aware of the sensitive, sensitivity of the blocks. Mm -hmm. And you sit there, and if you trust your training, you realize you have a whole hundred meters. You have the rest of the race. And sometimes it, it really shocks me that athletes this deep into their career make those type of mistakes. We saw, of course, Usain Bolt <laughs> make that mistake in 20, 2011. 2011. Yes. Um, but you have a whole hundred meters. And that's the way I think the people need to approach it. Mm. Is that even if I'm not the first person to react, I still have... 100 meters to go. Yeah, but to be fair to Julian Alfred and so on, she's in a stacked field, and she probably feels that she has to get an advantage at the start. And uh, the thing that I felt sympathetic about regarding Tinia Gaither and uh, Julian Alfred, it was because I couldn't visibly identify who it false started. You, usually when people false start, you can, you can see who made the first move. But in both instances, I, I saw nothing. There was nothing discernible yeah. to the naked eye, which is one of the things that makes it unfortunate. Yes. Because sometimes it's just about the putting pressure on the block yes. as you prepare for the gun. Yes. And then that makes you fall start, which is, this is what I have a problem with it. I mean, I know the rules are the rules, mm -hmm. but you have to understand the human element of all of this. Huh? You're, you're going into the blocks, you, you're here set, and you're anticipating the gun. Yes. So instinctively sometimes you push back on the blocks a little bit harder and boom, you're out. Yeah. And All right. The men's 100, the Caribbean has dominated this in recent decades until Sim 
Zimb you said Zimbini. Zimbini's win last year. Since 1998, we had um, Atto Bolden winning, mm. then Kim, Kim Collins, Kim then Kim Asafa Bailey Powell, Cole. then Lerone Clark, then Kimar Bailey, Bailey Cole. Cole. That, that's yeah. five yeah. champions yeah. in a row from the, the Caribbean. The chances of that happening, uh, a Caribbean reasserting himself in the 100 sprint starting tomorrow. There's Kimar Bailey Cole in his 2014 win. Yep. Yeah, tremendous finishing, uh, that finish that he had. And it's good to see him back on track. You know, he had a couple years where he wasn't performing as well. And this year, I believe he's run 10-0-4 yes. uh, at the Jamaica Nationals. And he strung together a good couple of races, 10-0-4, yes. um, 10-0-6, 10-10. So I think with his experience, his international experience and with health, yes. that he could be there for a medal. Simbina, to me, from South Africa, he starts as the favorite. He's the defending champion. He plays fifth at the recently concluded um, World, Championship. World Championships. Mm -hmm. He was fifth, I believe, at the Olympic Games, or fourth uh, at the Olympic Games last year. He's a top five finisher all the time. Yeah. And he's, he starts off, to me, as the favorite. Yeah. Yeah, and, of course, uh, there's Aminala from Kenya as well, who, 985 this year, got into Oregon late because of visa issues. So yeah. maybe this is an opportunity for him, again, to to demonstrate that he's as good as he's been saying he is all year. Yeah. So, you know, this is going to be, it's going to be quite interesting. Yeah, of there, course, there, the, there's CJ Green from Antigua who's run 10 0 1 this year as well. So it's going to be, I think it's going to be really competitive, the, the men's 100 meters, because Jamaica also has Conroy Jones who's run 10 flat. Um, there is also Nigel Ellis who's run, this is probably his best year consist, in terms of his consistency. So, you know, there is a, there's a, there's a, a solid field from the Caribbean who, you know, with the right, the right timing, I think, could end up on somebody could end up on the podium. Yeah, um, Oba, you you pretty much favored before we move on to the 400 hurdles for men. Uh, Kimar Bailey Cole doing something, you know, positive here, but he does have huge injury issues. And even when he ran the early rounds of the relays at the World Championship in Oregon, he did in his post race interview hint. Almost well, I interpret it to mean that he didn't trust himself to be at full tilt. Well, when you're when you're when you have been as injured as often as he has, yes, it's hard to trust your body. Yes, you remember back in 2015, <clears throat> he was in the pink of form before that race in London against Usain Bolt, where he pulled both hamstrings. Wow! Well, how do how do you do that? <laughs> and then in between that, he's got chick V. Yeah, he got COVID. Yeah, you know he he's like in the firing line for every disease that's ever passed through the world. So. It's hard to trust yourself when these things continue to happen to you. Yeah. And you feel, he almost quit. And he and I had a conversation last year mm. where he was pretty much this close to, to yeah. calling it a day because yeah. he's had so many mishaps in his career. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe this is an opportunity for him. He's been in great form this year. Mm -hmm. And hopefully he'll be able to overcome and, and run fast again. So yeah. 10 is in the offing. And because he wasn't in the individual events in Oregon, Maybe his coaches, you know, will get him into yeah. the kind of shape where he's ready, finally ready to yeah. break 10. Talking seconds. about the tough past few years for Kimar Bailey Cole, uh, Kyron McMaster, the defending champion in the 400 oh, meter hurdles exactly. from the British Virgin Islands, hasn't exactly had a, a good run himself because of injuries. And of course, he lost his coach, mm. Dak Samuel, in the hurricane there um, five, or five years ago. Yeah. And um, he is the defending champion, though, and he starts off as one of the 400 meter hurdles favorites. Yeah, absolutely. He is fourth place finisher at the Olympics last year, around 47.08, and is the number eight performer of all time. Right. Yeah. Uh, this season was a lot, was much more rocky for him. Uh, he had injuries, and even in the first round of the World Championships, he went over hurdle six, and he said he felt something in his hamstring, so he didn't even turn up for the semifinals. Um, their approach was that to take it more conservatively, and to look forward to the Commonwealth Games. Uh, he stated that he knew that he, or he felt that he would have made the finals at the World Championships. So a person who has run that fast, who is a defending champion with that history, I trust that they're making the right decisions, and I trust that he will be there for the podium as well. Yeah, really, really satisfying win for him at the Gold Coast in 2018, mm -hmm. uh, Leighton. And um, the sort of opposition that he faces in this 400 hurdles, which starts off the prelims on Tuesday, um, what are what are his his threats? You think? Well, off the top of my head, I can only think about Jahil Hyde because Jahil has run 48:03, makes him the third fastest Jamaican of all time, behind Winthrop Graham 47:60, and of course Danny McFarlane 48 flat. So, with the confidence 
that Jai would most likely be coming into this competition with. Yeah. Maybe he's looking to push for the seven. Yes. You know, so maybe that's a legitimate threat for him there. And especially since Kyron has not been in the best for, in best form in terms of injury yeah. so far this year. Maybe that's an opportunity for him to be yeah. beaten. But you know, forty seven forty seven oh eight is forty seven oh eight. If he can get even close to that, yeah. forty seven five or forty seven six, yeah. I think he should be pretty comfortable. Yeah, credit over to Kyron McMaster's advance over the years because as juniors Jaheel Hyde had beaten Kyron McMaster at the World Junior Championship, but after the transition to seniors, it's McMaster that has made the bigger mark in the senior division. And that happens sometimes, uh, but let's, as, as Leighton pointed out, let's not sleep on Jah Jaheel. Yeah. I think he made the finals of the World Championships. I believe he plays sixth or seventh, and he's having an outstanding year. There's also two other people I think we should look out for, you know, um, Moat from Jamaica. He's He's cut, rounded back into form. He's 48, 59, I believe, this year. So, so that's good for him. And I think there's a Canadian, a young Canadian, uh, uh, Metiver, that plays second at the NCAA mm -hmm. Championships, and a young Nigerian who goes to Baylor University. He has the fastest mark for under-20 athlete this year at 48, mm -hmm. 42. So I think keep an eye on those also to be challenging for podium positions. Yeah, I'm particularly, particularly pleased, Leighton, with uh, the BVI and the strides they've made. We saw the mark they made at the, at the Carifta Games in Jamaica back in Easter in mid-April, mid and it would certainly be another feather in their cap if McMaster could repeat here. It would be, and because especially it's been a bad year for them at the senior level, because not only is Karen so had injury issues this year, but Chantal Malone as the well. The jumper. Their long jumper has was had to pull out of the World Championship because of a continuing knee injury that kept her out. So their, their two major stars are not healthy this year. So it would be nice to see Karen get to the commas and, and end up on the podium. It would be a nice flip for what has been a challenging year for them. Yeah. And uh, we're going to take a break now, gentlemen. Uh, Obadele Thompson and Leighton Levy, as we look ahead to the opening of track and field competition at the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham and we'll talk about more track and field events on day one of that uh, division or that discipline after the break. Commonwealth tonight studio show is in its final moments as we look ahead to the start of track and field at Birmingham 2022 on Tuesday. The action starts early in the morning and here's uh, the overall schedule of broadcasts and the events up 2.30 a.m. 3.30 Eastern Caribbean time. Lone bowl for men. There's a three o'clock start of hockey between New Zealand and Australia. Four o'clock athletics heats. That's five o'clock Eastern Caribbean time. 5.30 Eastern Caribbean time. We have the swimming heats. And uh, 7 o'clock, artistic gymnastics. That's 8 o'clock Eastern Caribbean time. 8.30 Eastern Caribbean time, badminton. The team bronze playoff. Weightlifting starts at 9 o'clock Eastern Caribbean time. 10 o'clock Eastern Caribbean, table tennis. Those are the medal events. At 10.30 Jamaica time, 11.30 Eastern Caribbean. Red Hot Jamaica, 3 and 0 so far on the netball courts. They take on Scotland. And at 11 o'clock, we have judo medal matches. That's midday Eastern Caribbean time. The action continues in the afternoon with the athletics finals continuing. 1.30 Eastern Caribbean time, 12.30 in Jamaica. The swimming finals start off at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock Eastern Caribbean time. And don't forget the Commonwealth Tonight Show, which you're watching now at 6.30, 7.30 Eastern Caribbean time. And there's a highlight show as well, recapping the day's action at Birmingham 2022. That starts at 9 o'clock in Jamaica, 10 o'clock Eastern Caribbean time. Now... Leighton Levy and Obadele Thompson joining us to analyze the prospects for track and field starting Tuesday. Now, sprint hurdling is something that the Caribbean has been more than prominent in over the past couple of decades. And uh, the 110-meter hurdles, which is the men's event of the sprint hurdles, starts off with the prelims on uh, Tuesday as well. Hansa Parchment, who had the huge disappointment of uh, being injured just before racing at the World Championship, mm -hmm. um, among the favorites, Oba, for this gold medal. Yeah, absolutely. 
as the Olympic champion. Uh, we look forward to him becoming the world champion as well this year, but as many would have seen, very heartbreaking to have reached right on the track minutes before the final, go over a hurdle, and then get injured. I've never seen, I've watched, as we see on, on screen right now, I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. So hopefully they have that uh, taken care of. I believe that he would have won. I think he was in that good a shape. Yeah. He looked extremely confident. All season he's been been running well, and I know that he was he came off the European circuit early so that he could focus on that. So hopefully if he's healthy, he'll be able to get back on track and do some great things. But um, there's also some other great competition there, including uh, Barbadian Shane Brathwaite, who has made the last three world championship uh, finals yes. and has a bronze medal from 2014 of the Commonwealth Games. He's a 2019 uh, Pan American Games champion. Mm -hmm. And there are some others. That, that first heat, there are actually two semifinals mm -hmm. going into the finals. And that first semifinal features Brathwaite from Barbados, mm -hmm. Parchment, Jamaica. It also features Andrew Posey from, from the UK, yes. who was an Olympic finalist. He was, yes. And also... The other Jamaican. Broad Bell. Broad Bell. Broad Bell who is Bennett is in the first one, I believe. Orlando Bennett. Bennett. Orlando Bennett, Bennett yeah. is in the first one. So that's going to be a lot of action yeah. in that first. Quickly, before we leave Parchment, though, uh, Leighton, initially it was thought that he had a slight hamstring tear. Then the day after that, we heard it was just a cramp. What was the final reading on it? Well, the final reading on it is that the, there is a, there's an injury that he's still to recover from, actually. Yes. The past few days, they've been watching it with the, the, the idea that Depending on what, how, the, how he feels tomorrow morning, they make a decision then. So it's not certain that he'll compete. It is likely that he will, but it's not 100% mm -hmm. just yet. So, you know, fingers crossed for, for – because this, the, the funny thing about it, the great irony about it for him, for me, is that in previous years, Hans Parchment does always come into the season injured. <laughs> this year, he came into the season healthy Perfect. and running great. And then all of a sudden, before the biggest race of, his, of, his, of the year, yeah. he gets hurt. And now possibly might even miss a second opportunity as well because he's not 100%. So that, that's a great irony about this season for Hansel yeah. Parchment. So outside of the 100 sprints, men and women, and the 400 hurdles and the sprint hurdles, what events are we looking forward to most on opening day, Obo? I'm looking forward to that women's 800. It's stacked. Uh, of course, Jamaica's Natoya Go will be there. We also have the Olympic silver medalist and the world champion silver medalist, Keely Hodgkinson, uh, representing oh, England. Oh, she was brilliant in Oregon, wasn't yeah, she? She was. Came very close. We yeah. have the Kenyan, Mora, who came third in Oregon at the recently concluded world championships. You have the 2019 world champion uh, from Uganda. And you also have, in the field, you have the seventh place fin fi finisher for the Olympic Games, Alexandra Bell. She hasn't broken two minutes, but it's the 800 meters and... Amazing things can happen within that two, two laps. And you also have Laura Muir, who is the 1,500-meter silver medalist from the Olympic Games and the third-place finisher from the World Championships in the 1,500, yes. who's dropping down to the 800 meters. Yes. A quick comment from you, Leighton, on the change of tactical running from Natoya Gould, who has spent most of her career setting the pace and... Um, leading her field. We saw her in Oregon sitting off the pace and then coming on. Good or bad? Well, the strategy seems to work for her. I mean, the thing is, when she sits behind, I think she's got to get closer to the leaders a little earlier. Earlier than because, she did in the final yeah, in Oregon. Yeah, because she ran 157.90, which was a season's best for her up to this yeah. point. But because running from the front, when you're up against an athlete yes. who, for example, has run 49.5, yes. you can't stay with her because... Yes. Not that Toya's best over the 400 the last few years is 52.15, I think. Yes, yes. So you, she, the strategy seems to be working for it. It's something that she's been working on all season. Yes. It looked good in Oregon. Mm -hmm. So maybe they can find a way to improve upon that, get closer to the leaders, yes. and end up on the podium at the Commonwealth Games. Okay, Libe, thank you very much. Obadeli, thank you very much as well. Track and field starts on Tuesday, and the action will be live on the Sportsmax broadcast platforms starting early in the morning. Our broadcasts actually start at approximately 2.45, 3.45 Eastern Caribbean time with Lawn Bowles. This takes us to the end of our Commonwealth Tonight Studio Show, recapping what happened on day four at the Commonwealth Games. They call it Birmingham 2022. Uh, so we will continue our coverage in the morning when George Davis will be in to take you through the continuity and just to weave you through the action at the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham. Birmingham.